Robert Hine is the supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer, and Joshua Berger is re-recording mixer on United States versus Billie Holiday about the singer's struggle uh, against the federal government due to her recording the protest song, Strange Fruit. Uh, now, of course, when you think of Billie Holiday, you think of her voice, so naturally it drives a lot of the movie. Um, so how did, how did her voice and, of course, Andrew Day playing her in the movie uh, guide your work on, on the film sound design? Well, we were uh, struck by her performance um, when we got the footage, when the footage started coming in. She's so amazing and her voice is so beautiful that our goal was to um, retain that beauty and not do things to it that might cloud it or, or obscure it. We just wanted to stand back and allow her voice to sing out. So um, I think we, uh, we were happy to have such a beautiful performance to work with. <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree with, the, with those uh, sentiments. Like, um, yeah, she, she's just so fantastic. And they did such a good job of uh, capturing her and her performance. We, we did our best to kind of let her shine. Um, we, we, really treated her voice kind of in a, in a minimalistic way. She, she, we designed kind of each space that she was in to sound a little bit differently um, uh, as she kind of grew throughout the film. But, uh, but yeah, she's just a fantastic performer and, uh, and she's got a fantastic voice. And, you know, there's so many musical performances in the film and they range, uh, widely in terms of the uh, in terms of the venue she's in so like I'm sure it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of uh, method of capturing her voice in each of these different scenarios uh, how much work was it to kind of adapt the sound to uh, whether it's Carnegie Hall or a, a smaller club uh, in terms of what what sound you're creating I, I think we did we did a lot of that actually you know we really tried to treat each location um, uniquely uh, where she was in the story and, and where she was, um, like you're saying, kind of in the smaller uh, clubs and then kind of in Carnegie Hall. We used a lot of different elements to, to make it seem like the, you know, Carnegie Hall was, was a really, you know, high point in her career and she was very, you know, the, the audience was enveloping, uh, whereas other places in, in, the, in the jazz clubs, you know, people are kind of chattering not really listening to her, you know, kind of earlier on in her career, they didn't know necessarily who she was, or they kind of treated her at not quite the um, celebrity that she that she became. So uh, yeah, we, we, we tried to treat each space and, and held it true to the story where she was in the narrative. So we, we definitely spent a lot of time with that, right, Bob? Yeah, I mean, uh, her career evolves through the film. So we, we um find her at the beginning of the film, at the beginning of her career. And as Josh said, uh, the clubs were lively. People were jumping and talking and laughing. And we wanted it to feel like that. We wanted to, to represent what it was really like for her. <clears throat> and then when she was in Carnegie Hall, um, she, she had, uh, quite a diverse audience. <clears throat> so there was a lot of, you know, atmosphere that the crowd uh, also contributed. So we, we wanted to create that also. So a lot of care went into her performances. Uh, and then you've got uh, in the film uh, you know, being set in, in largely the 1940s and 50s, uh, like you know, just, just the sounds of the era, uh, you know, of, of what, what's happening in the world around her. Um, was that uh, uh, difficult or challenging or require a lot of uh, research to, to, you know, make sure there wasn't too much modern noise or, 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 or kind of audio? Oh yeah, we, we are very careful to create everything you see and hear for its time period to be correct. So, <clears throat> When you see a car go by, you know, that car is what it would sound like in the 1940s or 50s, not, not a sort of uh, reconditioned motor that 
still runs that car, which is what the set has, you know, we, we wanted those cars to sound exactly like they did. Um, and there was also throughout the film, sound design working with the actual location sound. So we were integrating <clears throat> a lot of real sounds and a lot of sound design, which touched emotionally into the film. We also recorded a lot of, you know, uh, loop group and walla, very site specific things that um, that we kind of weave throughout the film. So a lot of the, you know, chatter that was happening backstage or stuff that was happening on the street, we tried to make sure that that was very um, period specific too, because that's a big part of creating these atmospheres. You know, the movie goes from being very big and these big performances to kind of quiet. Um, you know, all within a couple minutes. So trying to keep the action going, kind of just when it's like one-on-one -on -one, um, and there's more of these intimate moments, but creating space around the characters and making sure that it doesn't feel like they're, you know, by themselves, or at least that they, um, that the things that are happening around them are of the period, and you know, specific like that. One of the uh, uh, specific sequences in the film that I keep coming back to just because it's such a memorable uh, piece of work was the scene where uh, Billie Holiday comes across the scene of the lynching, um, which is a continuous shot. Um, and, you know, it, it seems like a very complex uh, kind of sequence uh, in terms of the sound in particular, because they're, you know, in, in, you know, in addition to the film's other realism, there, there's a kind of a sense that you're, you're in her her head and, and her very subjective experience in that sequence. Uh, what, was, what was creating that scene like? We, we were very fortunate because Lee Daniels likes to collaborate early on. And with Jay Rabinowitz, the picture editor, we got uh, samples of that sequence early on. And we um, created a template which we would send back and forth and go over with Lee Daniels quite often. <clears throat> um, so that scene did um, require a lot of attention and it, it, it's a very dramatic dynamic scene and it goes from very powerful, strong sounds to almost silence or an echo of, of Billie Holiday's voice. Um, and it weaves back and forth and in and out and along with the music until it crescendos into, into a silent moment of her on the stage. Um, and so um, we mix that quite, um, quite delicately and it evolved quite a bit from when we started to where it is now. We had, you know, we had elements of the music. So we had, you know, the separate vote. There's a big vocal track there. There's some strings, there's pads. There's all these elements in the music too that we really kind of wove together as she kind of gets through, you know, as she sees the cross, as she sees, as she gets into the house and then as she gets onto the stage. So we really did this delicate dance of not only just between sound effects and music, but between the music itself and, you know, when to hear her voice or when to hear, the sound of, um, you know, the, the tablecloth, things like that. And then like Bob is saying, we've got a silence too. And it just allows the viewer to kind of be with her. And then when she comes on stage, you, you really don't know where you're gonna end up. And then she's on stage and then it hits you. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful moment that again, we just, we try to hint at certain things with the sound, but it took a while to, to get it to where it is now. And I think it, it's really nice. And then when you get to that performance of Strange Fruit, it's such a, like the full performance really focused entirely on her face uh, visually. Um, and, and the sound of that scene is also so memorable because it's so much focused on her voice. And there's a moment where like it, like sort of the sound drops out around her and you can even hear her earrings and it's so haunting. Uh, uh, what was that like to put together? Because it, it really is one of the most uh, memorable sound moments, I think, in the film. I think, you know, if you if you listen to that song, it, it just the Billie Holiday original, you get chills because it's just so moving and, and the performance is great. And then how Andra kind of shifted it and changed it a little bit to be her own or, or you know, for, for the film a little bit. And it has this, again, same kind of like 
uh, not eeriness, but kind of otherworldliness around it. And that's kind of what we wanted to achieve, I think, with it too. We add a little bit of echo to her voice so that, you know, when we listen back in 5.1, it kind of sounds like we're sitting in the audience watching her um, and it has a little bit of that, you know, ambient around her. And, you know, we add a little textures, Bob, like with the with the earrings and the and the movement of, she, has, she was wearing kind of like a dress that has a little bit of like, you know, sound to it as well, but it's really meant to hyper, analyze some of those things so that you so not only do you feel like you're watching her but you're, you're right there with her too so you could feel the emotion of the song and, and I think that um, when we saw that I mean when I saw that the first time it's, it's so impactful and I think now that we've added you know a little bit of this and that it it, it, it kind of elevates it to even further of this you know amazing amazing performance. And uh, what are the, some of the different challenges, uh, you know, working on the sound for a film that's this very music driven like this one, as opposed to different kinds of films that maybe are more action driven or, or you know, like what, what, what are the different difficulty levels going into those? Well, well Lee Daniels is an uh, incredibly creative director. So one, one of our challenges is um, he's constantly recreating the film as we work. And the musical performances actually, they solidified early, but everything around them was changing a lot. So we had to get our, our way into, into those scenes and out of those scenes was um, <clears throat> um, never a, a nailed down target. It was constantly moving. So, we were, we were, um, had to st step back for a minute, take in what we were seeing and, and let our creative uh, uh, sensibilities click in to, to, go, to go from the film itself into the musical sections. Even though this film has a lot of music, it's not a musical, you know what I mean? It's a film about the music. And, and I think that just like these other sections outside or around the musical performances are just as important and really help set the scene and tell the story. And like, you know, there's the one where she kind of gets into that scuffle backstage and, and kind of gets like the air knocked out of her a little bit. And then she has to go to perform. And so, you know, like it, it's very telling, you know, that what's happening right before we go into this performance and we treated her performance a little bit different based on what was just happening. So it's again, like what Bob is saying is we, we really made sure that, you know, it wasn't just all about the music. It was really about, you know, the dialogue and the drama and all of that, um, that happens, you know, just outside of the frame. Uh, and the film is streaming on, on Hulu. Um, uh, so audiences are finally able to see it. Uh, but I wonder if, if, like as you know, people who work in sound, uh, you think of you know how like an audience is is experiencing something when you know they're largely watching it at home on you know as opposed to in a, in a movie theater setting. Like what that what that sound experience is like. Is it you know? Do you think it it's you know you could still feel that full like uh, sense of it, or 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 is that movie theater experience something that you still uh, especially uh, are are driven by and driven towards? Well, I, I hope the movie theater experience never goes away because it's great to, you know, get with a bunch of people, sit in a dark room and just be transported somewhere else. But uh, for this film, we actually spent, we knew that it was going to be kind of streamed and, and you know, we mixed it in a, in a large, you know, theatrical environment. But we also spent a lot of time listening to it on a smaller, you know, on smaller speakers or for a smaller uh, playback environment. So we spent a lot of time making sure that the elements and the details all kind of came through and, and that the performances weren't just, you weren't gonna have to, you know, surf your your volume control and, on your remote, you know? So it was, we, we really made sure that it had the same kind of dynamics that it would get in the theater, but to be able to translate for um, for the smaller environment. And I, I watched it on Hulu the other day and I, and I think it it did a pretty good job of, of translating from that. I mean, if you, there's nothing to be said when you have a whole bunch of speakers, you know, and you're sitting in the dark and it's like, Billy Holiday, beautiful music coming at you. But, you know, it, it, we still had the same intent when it was playing back on, on a smaller environment as well. 
Uh, and, and this is a, a, an interesting, unusual uh, Oscar year for, for many reasons, uh, but it's also uh, the first year uh, where, where we have uh, best sound editing and best sound mixing combined. I wonder if either of you has uh, thoughts on, on, on the Academy's decision to do that. Do you think that was uh, uh, wise or do you wish they still had both categories or, 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 or do not like have a, a strong opinion one way or the other? I, I would say I, I think it's a good decision because we're merging our skills. And when Josh and I work together, his, his domain and my domain merge and we, we don't feel any hesitation in, in encouraging a direction or making a comment or participating you know, in what's going on. And you know, nowadays we, we um, understand the technology, the editing technology is understood by the mixer and the mixer technology is understood by the editor. So we're kind of one, we're, we're kind of uh, united a little more than it used to be. I agree. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I want to congratulate you both on your work uh, on this film, um, and uh, you know, you know, anyone who watches it, uh, like, it, it, however many speakers you have in your home, turn them all on to listen yeah. to Andrew Day as Billy Holiday, um, and best of luck as more and more people see it. And thank you so much for talking about it. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Mm -hmm.